we are on the second hour of Brave Business Conversation, and as promised, we have Jules Mitra here. Hi, Jules. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Welcome to the other side of the desk. Yeah, thank you. It's so exciting <laughs> to be on the other side. It's it's a lovely it's a lovely feeling to be in somewhere familiar, but in a, also at the same time a completely unfamiliar setting as well. <laughs> now, Jules um, hosts Meaningful Matters uh, Thursday evening shows. Yeah, Thursday That's between right. seven to nine. Yeah. And then is it the uh, Friday night fry up? So I do, night yeah. Night. So I have uh, meaningful matters, which is very cerebral, very kind of uh, empathic and deep conversation. And then Friday night fry up is just chaos, stupidity, cheesy <laughs> classic tracks. The two sides of yeah. Jules yeah. here on Radio <laughs> um, So it's very interesting how I got to know Jules. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, this is the first time I've met you. In person. It is. Uh, but thanks to Jules, one of my friends were interviewed about a uh, a topic that she was very passionate about. You know and. Uh, and it was about parenting, was it? About yeah. So um, she she has two children, and one of them she hasn't spoken to for eight years, and it's it's something which she wanted to raise awareness of. It's called alienation, um, parental exactly. alienation, and she's very passionate about the impact that pe- when parents split up. So you know, sometimes um, one parent will poison the children against the the other, and actually encourage the the disintegration of their relationship, the severing of it, um, and that's something she experienced. Um, exactly. So. About. She was a dog walker friend. Yep. Oh, and okay. Then, um, and then I said, well, I can't, I don't do that stuff, you know, and I do more business stuff. And yep. then I put it out in the WhatsApp group for the presenters. I said, look, I've got this amazing topic. Who do you think can interview her? And everybody in the entire, unanimously, everybody says, Jules, 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 Jules. Aww. Because you just, <laughs> you're famous for digging meaningful things. Where did that yeah. come from? Tell us more about that, this whole talent you have. Um, do you know, it's in, uh, oh. That's a really that's a really good question and and a kind of tough one to answer in a pithy way. Um, I I've grown up in a very very troubled dysfunctional background um, and and have gone through a lot of darkness at times in my life and a lot of challenges as as I think most of us have actually. Um, and you know I th- I think what it what what that does is it gives you an insight into people and into the world in a in a deeper sense and having come through that I think generally you know I'm a pretty happy uh, at peace with myself kind of person now I wasn't always but having got there what I've realized is that actually the the thing the left first of all I think the challenge is always lessons and it was really fascinating you know listening to you just now talking about your experience as a 26 year old and and those lessons because I think often what we see as painful we judge as bad or or you know just distressing for us often actually teaches us the most valuable lessons and I think that's true not just of me but of everyone so I'm I'm always keen to to connect with people and help and and learn from them and help each I think all of us actually learn learn from each other we learn from experiences we learn from relationships um and so for me that those are the things I kind of want to celebrate and and elevate and share and not just my experiences, because I'm I'm one of billions, um, mm-hmm. and I you know I fundamentally believe we're all, we're all equal, and and all of us have have value and lessons we've learned and lessons to share, um, and so that's something that's been, yeah, I think that's been good. That's been the gift life. of your life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good, and uh, so it, it's about finding meaning. It's about not not being superficial and saying I've done this in life, tick the box. I've done this in life, tick the box. But it's going deep into every experience and finding deeper meaning towards it yes. and you've done that as well with your travel passion yes i, I did i think as a teacher as, a, um, as an educationalist and but as travel i mean i've what I, I i started traveling at a very young age i was three years old when i went first from because i'm half my my father come, grew up in malaysia um right I was um, wondering what, what yeah. I was going to ask you about your last no, name. So. Yeah, so he's actually, he's, he's, he's Indian, so he's Indian Malay, yeah. so his family uh, obviously kind of emigrated from India. But I can remember f- travelling on this big, what seemed like a huge, you know, contraption across the, halfway across the world when I was three years old. Are you talking um, about a plane? Yeah, oh, a okay. plane. <laughs> and it's kind of funny now, because I get on planes, of course, and I'm, I'm, I'm six foot six, yeah, six I foot know. five, so, you know, they seem very, very small to me now, but at the time, it was this huge, giant tube uh, which stopped at multiple places on the way over to Malaysia. And I've and I can just remember emerging um from the plane in Kuala Lumpur and suddenly being hit by this humidity and heat. The trees looked different, the landscape looked different, the concretes even and the way it was laid out, the roads looked different. And it was like I'd been transported into another world. And from that moment onwards I've always been fascinated by travel and and how people live. And actually I think it 
it's fascinating actually because now as I've got older, I've realised that all of my passions relate to the same thing, and that is I'm fascinated with with the study of us as human beings, as as people, and 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 how we what makes us tick and how we operate. So I'm fascinated with history because I think you know it's exploring how other people live. I'm fascinated with tra- travel because it's how other people live, and and I'm fascinated with psychology and and how we think and how our behaviour is informed by by our experiences, by our circumstances and so on. So I think there's the, actually, holistically, it's all about people for me. Yeah, interesting. And I want to talk more with you after this break about your travel company, sure. In and Beyond Ba, and how you do travel differently. I mean, I, I take it as, okay, he's got a tour company. But uh, the more we talk, the more I feel like this is not a tour company for beginners. Yeah. This is a this is a travel experience if you want to go deeper into what you think you already know yes. and really find personal connection with history and yourself. If you're confused, you've got to get back. Stay with us. We'll be back after this. This is Radio Bath. Radio Bath. And we're back with Brave Business Conversations. Gosh, I almost could not say that <laughs> word. Um, I'm in, you know, I'm just amazed at the 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 talent that you have because it's about you know when you when you go traveling you see statues monuments you know castles or whatever it is and i'm the type of person that would actually if i'm allowed run my hands through these walls Mm. and then touch things and just say who has walked this prison for instance who was jailed there what were they feeling and how did they end up here and everything like that and i would get so emotionally involved in a piece of rock um but but it is about to me anyway traveling is not just about going to many different things taking pictures i totally agree with you when you said that earlier it is about finding that meaningful connection but what is it for you what is how do you connect with history you personally that's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I was always fascinated by history from a young age, um, and I th- and I think to me again, you know, and I was a history teacher, a history and politics teacher for fifteen odd years um, from university to until th- my mid thirties, and again, I was always fascinated by the lives that people lived and their experience of those lives. So when I think back to, for example, um, you know, I can remember doing, for example, the Tudors at school. And I had the most dull teacher ever. And I'm like, to teach history and make it boring is an absolute crime. And I would love to sh- have those people lined up and shot because it is so fascinating. And we'd learn about Henry VIII became king in 1503 or whatever it was. I can't remember. And then he passed this law and then the Reformation began. I'm like, who cares? I don't care about this stuff. What was it like for that scullery maid who lived in, I don't know, a gentry's house in the countryside. What was her life like? What was that experience? What would her experience of love be like? What would that be like growing up in a family? What would they be doing at that, you know, in their in their free time? Did they have free time? Mm. You know, did they have the same kind of stresses and pressures? Did they experience stress like we do today in the same levels? Were they much more content, even though they had much less? And for me, it's always a story of that human experience, which which touches me. And so when I look at something like Stonehenge, you know, and, and we, you know, we, I, I run a company which is really about trying to take people to the authentic kingdom, the places that people wouldn't know to look for even, um, but, you know, completely off the beaten track. But to me, that evoke something powerful. Mm. Um, but I also do the big stuff like Stonehenge. And for me, it's like, I can go to Stonehenge and say, well, Stonehenge was built around about 2600 BC, blah, 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 there's Hammy over many stones. Like, but that doesn't matter as much as who, what was society like at that time? Mm. Who were the people that built it and why? And and for me, you know, I mean, I often talk to my guests and say, to me, Stonehenge marks a transition. It marks a transition from a prehistoric age of Neolithic hunter-gatherers to the very earliest beginnings of a settled society. This, and that's the thing that has shaped our history ever, ever since. And Stonehenge is that kind of shift. Um, it's a calendar, it's the first time where people are starting to have to rely primarily on crops for the first time in their lives. And so they need to understand seasons properly for the first time in their lives. And it's that kind of, oh, okay, so these people are kind of changing, living a very primitive life. And it's, it's, it's a story. It's a story. It's the... It's innovation. It's the, and they can yeah. say, well, what am I going through in my life? What things yes. didn't don't work anymore? After yes. the pandemic, for instance, what things yeah. will never work anymore? Yes. And like, uh, not even the pandemic but even the uh, the innovation of online shops things simple things that we grew up with don't work anymore yeah 
and uh, whatever we're holding now in our hands, like a mobile phone and everything, this is like what Stonehenge was to those people, a calendar. Absolutely, yes. You know, and, and it transformed and, them. Yeah, and then it's like history repeating itself because it's like we're still seeing things that go obsolete because times have changed. Yes. And this is just an example of it. So that makes a lot more sense than just, ooh, look at those rocks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it comes from my education background, actually. As a teacher, I realised very quickly, and I think, again, there was part of me that was already there, but also that as I evolved as a teacher, was I was thinking, I've got a class of 30 students in front of me. Why are they here? They've got an hour or two hours, whatever it's going to be with me. What is the meaning for behind the, for this and so when I, th I taught history it was always how does this relate to your life now how is this significant to you because otherwise it's just abstract acquisition of knowledge and that means nothing yeah. so for me everything that I, I try and teach you know for example if I ever taught the holocaust I could teach you know when it began how many people were involved the, the geographical locations but that's mean I'm, I'm like actually what does that tell us about our, our own humanity how, that you could have a society which is supposedly civilized could end up you know um perpetrating something like this and if you're not actively part of it you're complicit in that environment in many ways and 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 what are the choices that you'd have to make at that time and what does that say about people and actually yeah. human beings to me are actually relatively um the same all the way you, you can look back at people from the prehistoric era and actually if, if we plonk them into the modern day of course they'd be awed for uh in the immediate moment but give them a you know six months they'll be using their iphone and <laughs> so on, um, and texting people I mean, we're highly adaptable but, but we also have these very fixed behaviors and exactly pre, pre, when know. i go to the holocaust museum or mm. i can't remember where i've gone every city that has a holocaust museum i'm there yeah. you know i think i just i just see like look at this fear driven behavior yes the fear of having someone else that looks different or whatever yeah. and making a whole campaign propaganda to have the whole country be afraid of them as well mm. and then obsolating but we do that too i mean i come from a country with hundreds of well no thousands of tribes yes the fact that we have one language the indonesian language is only since 1940s yes okay and uniting people and and still you know people segmentize you know categorizing people naming names and and treating people in a different way because they look physically different yes um uh, is is common where i come from and not to mention religion and when we get to that oh topic, gosh that's yeah even, that's not easy that's <laughs> not easy and coming up from a religious background as well yeah. and then finally having that realization in my life like this is grouping yeah and and this is is this what i want yes. for me you know, it was no longer, it was such a big shift because everybody, even now, is still a religious, uh, it still holds on to religion. And I made a personal choice just consciously out of what I want to live by is love, not yeah. grouping, not not um, categorizing, even though thankfully I was taught love through religion. I wasn't, yeah. taught, I wasn't taught hate or anything like that. But it was about that. Every time I look at the history of the Holocaust, the history of religion, the history of kingdoms and everything, yes. there's always some kind of labeling around them. And it's very interesting how we still label today. Yes, in group and out group or the other. Yeah. There's us and we're the yeah. we're the pure ones. Especially we're the ones with the right morals and then they're different. Exactly. And that's, and that's they're the lesser. Thing. And then you correct. see it in the Holocaust Museum, all those posters about yes. the Juden and all that kind of stuff, right? You see yeah. all that stuff, oh, how distorted they are and how exaggerated just to trigger fear. And that's why my company is called the Brave Zone as well, right? Because it was the opposite of that. If we just make braver choices, sure. choices that come out of courage. Yes. And that's how I, I think I got that from inspiration of about learning that history. Have Have you ever been interviewed on your show about your story? No. I think we, that, <laughs> that needs to happen. A... <laughs> I think that needs to happen. Because I think yeah, that's we'll, fascinating. We'll, we'll exchange. We'll, we'll yeah. do like a, a, a show swap. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have more interesting things. I hope you're getting a feel of this because, and, um, and you know, as Jules talks about what he does with his travel company, I'd like to give you a feel that this is not a travel company that we – we often see, you know, with the big coaches and the flags and everything. I used to be a tour guide in 1995. Oh, did well. you? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I know travel companies. Yep. It's not, this is not it, you know. Yep. It, it is something that is deep and meaningful and I think educational. We'll be back okay. with more after this. We're back with Brave Business Conversations with Jules Mitra, founder of In and Beyond Bath. 
a tour experience that connects you with history. Indeed. So tell us a story. Tell us a story of a place we might know, but we don't know. Okay. Um, well, I, t I mean, I I'll, give, I'll give you an example. Yeah, so so what I try and do, is we, we com I combine, you know, as I said earlier on, the must-sees with the, the unspoken, and I'm, I'm really keen to share kind of culture, literature connections, literary connections, um, and, and particularly history, obviously. I'm a, I'm a historian, and for me, as I travel around, I just see history everywhere. When I drive through a, a town, I see the buildings as they once were, not necessarily just as they are, so I can see, you know, cobblers or blacksmiths and so on. Um, and that's really important to those those kind of experiences. But I'll give you I'll give you an example. There's there's a castle not far outside of Froome, um, and Somerset doesn't have many castles. In fact, I think it's only got two, um, because it was never in a kind of border location or anything like that. It was never you know it was relatively peaceful once the Normans rocked up, so it doesn't have many castles. But this this particular little village has a castle there. And again, I, I take people to it because it's got this perfectly preserved moat. It's this beautiful kind of um, keep. You know, and actually, it's very French. It's it's unique. It's it's almost like something you'd expect to find in northern or central France Ooh. than in England. And that's because the guy who built it was a, a was a knight. His name was Sir John Delamere, and he was a knight. Now, knights are gentry. They are not nobility. Knights do not have castles. They have manor houses. Um, but this guy went off to France to go and fight in the Hundred Years' Wars in the thirteen hundreds. And we always thought he must have been a really good soldier. Because he goes to France as a knight, he comes back with enough money to kind of turn his manor house into a fully-fledged castle. Wow. And actually, so for years and years, people have thought this uh, this unique building, which which is kind of sitting in the middle of a little village by a little river, in the worst possible place for a castle, because it's in the valley. It Nunny. Nunny Castle. Um, and and you, you, it's just a stupid place to put it. And you kind of think he must have been really good at fighting because he, he rocks back up in England. He's like, check me out. He's on the rise. He's social climbing. He's built himself a castle. Until about 15 years ago, a local historian decided to actually go and investigate which battles, because obviously there's been a whole series of battles at the time he was alive. And so the thing, theory was he was a great knight. He was a really good warrior, captured enemy nobles and so on. And, and in those days, what he did is you captured them. Instead of killing them, you captured them and ransomed them back to their families for exorbitant sums. So we thought, he, well, he must have done that several times over. Until we checked the records, because we still have the manifest of these battles, um, you know, in the in the British archives and so on. And he doesn't appear in a single battle, which kind of created more questions <laughs> than it answered. <laughs> and um, it transpired that actually he wasn't such a great warrior as a great, um, what's the best way? I was going to use a, a, a colloquial term, which probably is not appropriate for radio. He was very good at endearing himself, shall we say. <laughs> and he actually became very good friends with the king and became part of the king's entourage. And the king then entrusted him with managing the supplies and, uh, yeah, for, for, for the campaign in France, this big campaign. So he's in charge of all the kind of supplies to feed the army, you know, setting contracts and all that kind of stuff. So we actually think he's probably a better embezzler than he was <laughs> a knight, and he, a soldier. And anyway, he comes back, he builds this massive castle, and it is just the, just the keep remains um, with this beautifully preserved moat. It's the deepest moat in English history. Um, completely unnecessary because it's in a valley. The whole castle itself, again, massively impressive. But it's, I, I mean, and, and this is something else I always like to do again, is how do you attach meaning to this to us today? And I call it the Trump Towers <laughs> of the 1300s. I was it's, say, it's yeah, just posh. It's just this massive <laughs> edifice to ego. Because, like, for example, the, the drawbridge leads straight to the front door. It should really be on the first floor. There's kind of... Um, it's all about convenience on the inside. So the staircases spiral the wrong way. It would actually aid an attacker rather than a defender. You put um, staircases inside flat walls, which is, just means there's a cavity in the wall. You wouldn't do that if it's a defensive castle. So it looks yeah. the part, but it's a complete fake. Um, and it's because this guy's just massively vain, basically. It's just a massive homage to his own vanity. Um, and so we go there, and actually half the castle wall is missing on one side because his family are there from the 1300s up until the 1500s. He gets sold to a, a family in London by that point, a merchant. And again, another social climber. He's made money in shipping and now wants to kind of join the aristocratic classes. What better way to do that than buy a castle? So this guy comes from London. It's like kind of escaped this countryside kind of 15th century style. Uh, and anyway, he comes along. Basically, he, he, he makes it look nice, puts some big windows in it instead of the arrow slits, things like that. Puts little um, kind of... Uh, 
base around the edge of the castle because otherwise it'd been water would have gone up to the walls you know a very beautiful medieval castle anyway he has it for about 50 years the english civil war starts and the whole war goes on for four or five years and this castle's in the middle of nowhere it's plonked in the middle of it's not strategic it's it's just a vanity project anyway king charles gets captured this guy's a royalist and a catholic and so he's part, very, very much a royalist and the parliamentarians turn up in 1644 Basically, as a just kind of an official, kind of we're just mopping up here, sign the papers to say that you're sorry for being a royalist. You know, you can keep your castle. We'll move on. <laughs> and the new lead, the new guy that owns it, is like, no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight for king and country to the to the death. And so the war's kind of petered out. But this guy, with about we think seven or eight men in his castle, that's his garrison, seven or eight men, decides to hold out against a parliamentarian army. And so a siege begins for two days. And basically, the board. <laughs> Rather bemused parliamentarians, just like, oh, all right, guys, listen. Um, I'll tell you what, can you get a messenger back to Bath? Just bring a couple of cannon over here. And because the castle's in a valley, they fire two shots from the nearby hill over the outer wall into the inner keep, smash this wall. And, and it's like the whole wall today is pretty much fallen away. Um, so people think, oh, well, mate, they, they must have just blasted the heck out of this wall. And that's not what happened. What happens is you have two cannonball-sized holes in the wall and mr i will fight to death comes out and says do you know what? let's parlay let's have a chat <laughs> <laughs> and um decides to surrender his castle and actually the, he, he then gets stripped of his title they take they and usually castles are ruined in this country today because after the, the civil war royalist castles were often deliberately slighted they had bits pulled down so they can be used for defensive purposes mm. afterwards the parliamentarians don't even bother with this place. They're just like, it's so clearly indefensible. We stick cannons over there and fire over the top without any fear of retaliation. Yeah. Let's just take the floorboards out. So they strip the castle place of the floorboards. And of course, over time, it starts to decay and so on. And eventually, those two holes get bigger because of ivy and frost and so on. And in 1910, that wall just goes... Mm. Collapses into the moat and English heritage come along and go, no, this is significant. This is the only French-style castle in the whole of England. We've got to preserve this. So it's now just sitting there with its moat, this beautifully preserved keep, um, really romantic, very, very small site hidden in a village. Um, so it's, and I love the sign there. It's an English heritage site, but it's not ticketed. So you don't, you don't have a, an office to go and pay and see. And so it has opening hours. And I love this because it's a little, little bit of information. It says opening hours, any reasonable hour, <laughs> which I'm like, that's... Every day. Mildly ambiguous, isn't it? <laughs> There's no ticket box. There's no ticket. So we get it's to walk around it, yeah, and you see all these lovely features in it. So you can see the hot fireplaces. And what does that mean windows. to you? What does that, historically, like, I love the story and everything. Do you get your, when you hear that story about the castle, what does that mean personally? It, it just, again, shows me, like, how, no matter how far we've come, how how very much the same we are. You know, it, humans are very much to me defined by whether and, and i love what you said earlier on about fear and love i i believe there's there's, there's two parts to us we have our mind-based ego personality which is based on fear anxiety and we have our heart-based whether you call it soulful whatever which is actually very open and those two parts combine to to determine who we are and how you know how we act and so on and you know i look at the two owners of this castle and donald trump is not a new phenomenon <laughs> <laughs> that night yeah that night <laughs> that night in the 1200s 1300s rocking up and kind of brown nosing the king and like hey you know i'm gonna be your best mate and and then using that opportunity to kind of embezzle funds and siphon money away for his own purposes yeah that's still here that's still very much part of our everyday now um or the arrogant guy who the, the war's over <laughs> the have lost you know the king's in custody <laughs> I'm going to fight. <laughs> you know, that's that. Donald Trump again. Exactly. Well, it is actually. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But that kind of absolute denial of reality or kind yeah. of practicality. It's, And again, it's the human story which makes it so fascinating. As well as when you go there and you can see the fireplaces. What would this have looked like? What would this have been like? Which, of course, to me, is completely enchanting and, and riveting. Um, and that's what I'd love to share as well. Like, So you're looking at these kind of brown, you know, or, or bare stone walls. But... You know, castles, for example, when they were when they were active, as as with our, all of our churches as well, in fact, and and most of our houses would have been plastered inside and out. We we look at this kind of bare stone, a setting. Go, isn't that lovely and old and old England? You're like, no, that's Victorian England. That's the Victorians looking at all the ruins and going, oh, look how lovely and enchanting and romantic they are. Let's let's take all the plaster off of our houses. So you go to places like Castle Coombe, of course, with all their lovely stone houses. Like that wouldn't be. That's not authentic. It's and th and that's what I love about history. It's it's 
it's that insight that into people but also lives and yeah. collectively and i remember going to northern california yeah. and visiting the winchester house Ooh. The the people who made Winchester rifles and everything. Yeah, oh, okay. And the wife is super small, like four foot something. But when the yeah. husband died, she she kept building staircases in the house. So in that one, well, relatively not so big house, has about 100 or so staircases. Wow. And it leads to nowhere. Wow. To no, and when you were talking about this, I also think about Neuschwanstein. Mm. You know, in Bavaria. In southern Bavaria, in, yeah. Yeah, in and I love going to that castle because there's uh, he was so into Wagner. He was so yes. into opera and Wagner and everything. And he built a cave <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> in one of the rooms. And when we entered that room, it's like, oh, my God, it's a cave. You yes. know? And he just thought, and, and that's just why that is a model for the Sleeping Beauty castle in yes. Disneyland. Because it is so like it, uh, romantic. Everything is so mythical, mystical yes. and everything. And everything is just so fairy, fairyland, you know. Yeah. Um, and then the Marion Bridge and everything. Yes, yeah, so the bridge that crosses the the, yeah. ca the chasm but to the, get to it. And, yeah, the yeah. Koenig, the the king that lived there, he was yeah. a bit woo, you know, yeah. and everything. He was a bit out of this world, and that's why he built the castle that was a bit out of this world as well. Indeed. And it was just, you know, but it is good to see that. Well, at least it was a reflection of him. Yes. You know, at least the interior part of it when he he renovated it. Anyway, very fascinating story. I want to get back to you more stories, sure. more with Jules Mitra after this. We're still with Brave Business Conversation, and we have Jules Mitra, founder of In and Beyond Bath. We're talking about how history connects with us and how to find deeper meaning when we go and look at the history uh, you know, around us. I mean, living in Bath history is everywhere, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I go down um, Julian Road, and I see those like odd-looking steps, you yes. know, the stone steps. I'm like, that is just ugly, <laughs> really badly built. Who built that, and what were they thinking? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and, um, and even those, uh, those iron fences uh, that uh, the tops are sawed off. Yes. Because they were made for bullets and everything, and just yep. that, that whole probably pretty modern history yes. where they needed iron or they needed metal for the war. And I just said, can you imagine people going around saying, we're going to saw these off now? Yep. And I just can't imagine being in that place. Um, but well, let's talk a little bit about relationships. As a, I was a tour guide as well. My group was 29 people strong. You know, we could <laughs> have a huge, cow, a huge, yes. huge coach and everybody typically came with their own group. Everybody stuck with their own group. What's the size of your group? Um, eight maximum, mm, and why that's is that? that's it's it's interesting because when I started, you know, like there's lo there's lots of minibus tours, and I've got a minibus license as well. And people said to me, "Well, look, you know, it's if you want to really make turnover, you've got to. It's about numbers." Um, <laughs> and and I was like, and, and actually, again, I, I got into this game because I thought it could be I could do it better, um, and that you know, and that means doing it differently. Um, and I was like, I don't want to do that. Number one, because. I don't want to just become a conveyor belt tour company where it's just like we do this, we stop here, we say this, which actually I feel again, you know, the kind of tourism industry tra traditionally has been, particularly tours, and and again for me it's about relationships and connection. It really is about connection, and and I kind of thought I likened it to a dinner party. I was like, actually, if I was going to spend two three hours with people, what's the difference between a kind of a, a, a party and a crowd? And for me, the magic number is kind of eight. It's like actually, if I go to somebody's house and there's eight people. I can probably have a meaningful conversation at some point with all of those people. Um, and that's what I, th I decided for my tours. I'm like, I want people to have meaning and actually for them to have that personalised experience where they have a relationship with the person who's showing them around. And that means you've got to invest time into that. And and, it, and eight people seemed about right. And it's and it's worked beautifully, actually. I mean, with I mean, most of my tours tend to be four to six. But it gives you time to get to know each of those people on on, on the trip. And... And actually, what I've you know I've noticed over the years is actually, I talk very little in comparison to people telling me about them because we're building relationships. Even if people aren't aware of it, they're building relationships and they're telling me about where they've come from, what they enjoy about traveling, what their experiences are, what they're you know they ask the amount of times I talk about you know the role of China in the world or how does the NHS work you know particularly to Americans who are just absolutely gobsmacked by this concept of the NHS or whatever it is um what's it like living in a country without guns for you know I mean I've had a lot of Texans come over sometimes and can't quite yeah. believe that we don't have guns um and 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 kind of awed by that and and also I think sometimes uh kind of horrified at the same time <laughs> um but it's those kind of conversations end up being the kind of core of the experience and then of course every time 
we, we, we're stopping. There's, you know, there's focal points, I call them, yeah. um, which is like, here's, there's something, you know, why are we coming here? There's something significant to share. Um, and so, yeah, eight, eight becomes and the, magic the magic number. number. Yeah, really? it's a good lucky number in yeah. Chinese culture oh. as well. So that's good. That's good. Well, Jules, I mean, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank it's been you. nice seeing history and travel being brought upon a different way. Uh, when I was 15, yep. my history teacher in high school was Joanne Woodward. And I admire her because she would tell Western European history as if it was a, well, sometimes it feels like a gossip tabloid. Yes. When somebody was sleeping with somebody. Yes. And she had all the mimics and she had everything and she made history come to life. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's why I think I love Western European history a lot because that brings me back to the memories sure. of, I was in her class. And you definitely have done that for us today in this show. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure to come on, but also to meet you, actually. So yeah, um, It's been fascinating. And how do people get in touch with you if they want to book a trip? Because we're all in the days of staycation. I recommend, after knowing Jules a little bit, for all those listeners out there, even if you're English, even if you've studied here, and even if you think you know everything you want to know about this country, if you're looking for a tour or a travel experience or a different experience this year that gives you the personal connection to these stories that you hear in the history books and deeper meaning, I do recommend you to talk to Jules. Oh, thank you. Well, the best, I mean, the best thing to do is get onto the website, uh, which is inandbeyondbath.com. Um, and is we've the got. And the, the no, it's 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 kind of funny enough. In our branding, it is the ampersand. We use the ampersand, but in in the website, it's in and, and beyond. Because I'm just like, it's too hard trying to find that yeah. on a keyboard, isn't it? Really, <laughs> <laughs> especially with different keyboards in different countries. Where's that? Yeah. Where is that yeah. um, sign? So, so yeah, in and beyond with the word and uh, bath dot com. Um, and we're we're on all the usual channels as well. We're on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. You know. Um, so yeah, you can find us in any of those kind of places, and it's quite easy as well. There's not many in and beyond baths, so yeah. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, just search for in and beyond bath, and you and and we'll pop up. Exactly, and if you want to contact uh, Jules directly, it's J U L E S. That's it, right? Jules. And Mitra with two T's. Yes, M I T T T R A. So you yeah. can find him everywhere in Google and all the proper sites. <laughs> Brilliant. Or in Studio Bath. You Indeed. Know? So, um, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. To catch up with you on your shows. Oh, thank you, Cynthia. And I actually, I hope. I, I, I think we said this off air, but I'd love you to come on Meaningful Matters. Actually, I think you're going. You'll be. You'll be amazing um, person to talk to. And because I'm, yeah, that's all about. I think people who've 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 gone on a really interesting journey and are, are, are open to sharing it. So um, hopefully we'll, do. we'll, we'll do. be doing that in a few we'll months. Do show, uh, show yeah. swap. We will. Show we swap. will. <laughs> okay, we'll be back uh, to close the show after this. Mm.